Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Washington. I'm Mark Emmert, the president of the university, and I'm delighted to not only welcome you here to the campus, for those of you that are guests, but, but also to welcome you to the last stop on the Bill Gates Unplugged Tour. Uh, Bill has now been to five other universities and spoken to packed houses. None of them as good looking as this crowd, though. Uh, well. None of them as smart as this crowd either. Is that right, Ed? So I got that right. Okay, good. Uh, and, and we're really pleased that, that he's saved the last and the best for the University of Washington in his backyard. This is obviously an audience that we don't have to spend a lot of time introducing Bill to, but it is important to note that here's an individual who has transformed, of course, uh, information technology and the, and the PC as we know it, and that in and of itself would have been a pretty remarkable accomplishment for anyone, but now he's in the midst of transforming philanthropy and global health and education and is likely to have that same kind of profound impact on the world yet again, and the man's younger than I am, so he's just a child. <laughs> so there's much, much more to, to go, and we'll see what Bill does for his third trick. But the fact of the matter is, for the UW, there are few families and few individuals that are more important to us than the Gates family, not just Bill, of course, but his mother and his father and his brothers, his, his brothers, his sisters. Uh, we've got with us today Bill Gates Sr. Bill, would you please wave to the audience? <laughs> Bill, as you know, Bill, as you know, is a trust, as a regent of the university, uh, as was Mary Gates, Mary for 18 years, I think, Bill, and. Uh, and now we have yet another regent uh, that's a Gates, and that's Christy Blake. Christy, thank you for being with us. And now, without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Bill Gates. Bill? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, fantastic to be here on the finale of my uh, final Microsoft tour. And I mostly want to talk to you about the great things ahead. Uh, but first, let me talk about the, the important relationship uh, that I have with this university. Uh, as Mark said, it, it starts with my parents. Uh, they were students and, and met here. Uh, my sister was a, a student here. I was here a lot, uh, but not as a student. I, I took a, an algebra course, that was good. But my main benefit uh, from the university was that uh, when computers were very expensive, hard to find, uh, there was no such thing as a personal computer, the university campus was the best place to wander around and find unused computers. Uh, and so Paul Allen and I, uh, particularly during a time when we didn't have any computer work, and uh, didn't, nobody was giving us free computer time, we found a number of machines and were able to develop our skills during high school. Uh, the best one was one that was in the, the physics building, and uh, they ran particle uh, analysis runs most of the uh, day, but they always had three or four hours at the end just in case the things ran long, and we'd go up there as soon as it was done and grab that PDP-10. So we were sort of stealing computer time, and now, uh, you know, I'm giving it back uh, uh, from time to time. Also, of course, Microsoft has an amazing relationship with the University of Washington where uh, the commitment to long-term research at Microsoft uh, has a lot in common with the, the great work going on at the university, uh, particularly the computer science department, but also now that software is being applied in so many domains and is really the, the tool for so many of the sciences, a lot of cutting edge software problems are coming out of the other departments, whether it's uh, genomics or um, the environment or uh, anything related to biology, we need to solve some very, very interesting problems. So it's fantastic to have uh, the university here and a lot of uh, people have joint appointments where they're 
involved in teaching and involved in helping Microsoft do its work. So that has been an absolutely fantastic connection. Uh, also, this university has become a, a very important partner of the Gates Foundation. Uh, the Gates Foundation has made more grants by a, a fair margin to this university than any other. And uh, the interesting thing about that isn't so much the size of those grants, but rather the kind of ambition behind them. You know, work related to the AIDS vaccine, uh, work related to malaria, work related to tracking healthcare approaches uh, and understanding where those are working and where, where those are not. Uh, because after all, a lot of things that seem like they'd work uh, when we get out into these developing countries don't. And making sure we guide that very well is important. So it's a wide range of things. And I'm very optimistic that there'll be, be big breakthroughs that uh, come out of, out of that work. Microsoft, uh, in a typical year, uh, has about 100 people we hire from the University of Washington, which makes it the top place that we've gotten talent all the, t all the time. Uh, and Ed Lazowski and I were talking today and saying, hey, we want that uh, to be even more. Uh, so hopefully some of these dreams about software and the great impact it can have will make people realize that not only is this an interesting field, but really this next decade, the companies that take a long-term approach are optimistic, hiring smart people, are really going to come up with some things that will be uh, game-changing. For myself, I'm uh, fairly near a transition point where I'll move from being full-time at Microsoft and doing part-time work on the foundation goals uh, to flipping that around, uh, where after the middle of the year I'll be full-time on foundation work uh, and part-time on Microsoft work. And you know, I've been writing software as my full-time occupation uh, for ever since I was 17. I had a couple of years where I was back at some other university, uh, but that didn't slow me down. I was still mostly writing software uh, the, the whole time uh, then. So it's going to be an interesting change, you know, not to wake up in the morning and say, okay, uh, let's primarily focus on, on software. And some friends of mine were worried about that uh, and thought, well, maybe they could help me uh, by putting together some thoughts about what my last day is going to be like. Uh, and so we uh, pulled together a video uh, to help me with the transition. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at that. It is a day the industry never thought would come. Join us all day as we report on Bill Gates' last full day at Microsoft. It's been in the planning for the past two years. He'll still be active as chairman. It's hard to believe it's really here. Yeah, I think Bill's ready for his last day. He's worked pretty hard, saved a little bit. He is completely focused. I mean, Bill's been going all out for more than 30 years, so not having a completely full schedule every day has been a little, well, interesting. Never doubt the magic of software. That's right, listen to Chewbacca. You know, after all these years, he's finally taking work-life balance seriously. He's even got a personal trainer. Curls. Four. Girls. Curls. Four. Girls. Uh, all right. Things we want to be, all right? I am oh, tuberculosis. Uh, yes, bye-bye tuberculosis. Yeah, headbutt, headbutt, headbutt. There we go. Feel yourself coming back, lean a little forward. Just think high, H-I, to the sky, you and I, right now. Yeah, Bill's always been a bit of a ham. But more importantly, it's the creative risks he takes that really set him apart. Big Pimpin', I'm Bill D. Big Pimpin', yeah, you know me. You got it. Killed it, Billy G. Hey, let me, let me get one thing straight with you. You can retire... And then unretire? Exactly. Gotta keep him guessing. Thanks, Jay. No, it was great. Not so much. Couldn't break his heart, though. Somebody gotta tell him. It was horrible. Don't forget. Here. Just take that. Hello, Bill? Yeah, yeah. Bill, I'm a little busy here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Dude, wasn't that the craziest riff you've ever heard? Oh, for f sake. <clears throat> Bill, we've, um, we've talked about this before. Um, we're, we're full up in the band. Bill. All, all positions are filled. Uh-huh. I know, I know, but I can't just replace Edge because you got a high score on Guitar Hero, Bill. Bill's always been a big fan of the movies, but he's probably gone a bit too far with this whole audition reel thing. Yeah, Bill, I talked to Clooney. I talked to Clooney myself. I had him on the phone. I heard his voice. It was George Clooney. I helped put him in ER. I know George Clooney. It's George Clooney. Well, fine. Talk to him yourself. I, I heard. No, we're just not doing an uh, Ocean's 14. That's... That, well, no, but if we were doing one, then, then we would hire you. Yes, we're just, we're not doing one. Right. That's okay. No, no, there's no, we're not doing a sequel to, to Syriana either. Um, everyone died. Hey, I, I was thinking the, the last time I was on the show, I, I thought it was really successful. Yeah, no, you were great on the show, man. We loved it. It was, although, you know. He did kind of run off at the end, like I, you know, had monkey pox. Bill Gates, Windows Vista, on oh, he's leaving! He can't just leave! You know, the only thing is, Bill, you know, and I never said anything, but uh, you never gave us our mic back. And, uh, you know, I hate to say anything, but we only have three. So... And you didn't hear this from me. It's a pretty strange coincidence that his transition date is right in the middle of the 2008 presidential campaign. I, I know you're super busy, but I, I'm sure you're starting to think about who would be your best running mate. No, I, I know I haven't actually declared a running mate yet, Bill, but I'm not sure politics is really for you. Hey, it's Bill. Bill Shatner of Star Trek? No, the other Bill. Bill Clinton? The man has a tenacious work ethic. No one is sure if he even sleeps. I've always been a startup kind of guy. So that's my next big idea. What do you think? Well, uh, solar-powered nanorobots grown from Justin Timberlake stem cells are intriguing, but they're really not my area of expertise. But we've got a new partner here at the firm who I know can help you out. Oh, hey, Bill. No, it's not an inconvenient time. Yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, that, that was a good one. We trust what you do. Of course, we'll miss him in the daily brainstorming meetings. He's always been an innovator, really inspiring all of us to think creatively about the future. And we'll be the first to give credit where credit is due. Oh, absolutely. Microsoft Bob, his idea, all his. Like I said, we've been planning for this. But he's still Bill, and we'll miss seeing him in the hallway every day. Hey, buddy. See you tomorrow at the board meeting. remained steady as Bill Gates completed his historic last full day at Microsoft. Personal note, all of us here at NBC News will miss reporting every night on this brilliant, powerful, let's face it, sexy and good-looking leader of men and women who just doesn't believe in paying more than $7 for a haircut. I'm Brian Williams in New York. Good night. Well, we had a lot of fun making that. And uh, actually, the transition's going great with uh, incredible people uh, like Ray Ozzie and Craig Money stepping up to do a lot of the things I've done and uh, free up my time for the, the new foundation work that I'm, I'm thrilled that I'll, 
I'll get to focus on. I will have some Microsoft projects uh, that I keep working on, and uh, as I talk through some of the big opportunities, uh, several of them are, are uh, of particular interest to me, things like uh, making search very different than it is today, and this whole area of, of natural interface. So let's talk about software and where it's going. It has come a long ways uh, since the advent of the personal computer. After all, software prior to that uh, was used only by a few organizations with big, expensive machines. And if anything, they were viewed kind of as the enemy of the individual. They were printing out checks and keeping databases. And so it's almost a complete shift that computing has become the best tool for creativity and sharing that humans have ever had. What's emerged around software on the internet now is the facility that makes the world a smaller place. And it's a fundamental element of the pace of innovation and the efficiency that we have in the, the world today. In fact, if you think about you know, growing up, uh, when I grew up, it was a paper-based encyclopedia you went to for any question, and you got very limited data. It was always kind of out of date. And if you compare that today to any student who has access, and the wealth of material that's available to them, uh, from encyclopedias to discussion groups to uh, models that will let them navigate through and try different things out, it's a, a completely different world. Now, at the center of that has been uh, breakthroughs in both hardware and software. The incredible uh, benefit of having exponential improvement at the chip level has allowed us to be more and more ambitious in software. Uh, the, the number of transistors is mapped to higher clock speeds, larger memories, and so-called Moore's laws really uh, allowed us to, to build phenomenal machines. Now, when Paul and I were young and, and uh, started Microsoft, we had in mind this idea that computing would be free, and so we let our minds wander to any uh, type of computer that uh, might be possible in the future. And even then, we thought about uh, some things that are not yet achieved, things like uh, visual recognition, speech understanding, uh, deep gathering of data uh, and, and machine learning that would relate to that. So in a sense, we can say we're only part way through achieving that original dream of software empowerment. Another way that we can say we're only part way there is just look at the, the population of the globe. Uh, personal computing, mobile phones uh, benefit less than a third of all people. Uh, there's about a billion PCs. Each of those gets used by multiple people. Uh, there's uh, about uh, two billion mobile phones that are typically used uh, only by, by one person. And so we're, we're there at about a third, and two-thirds are not getting any direct benefit. But the original slogan of Microsoft, going back to its very earliest days, was a computer on every desk uh, and in every home uh, using uh, powerful software. And so uh, there's a long ways to go in terms of making it lower cost, uh, more relevant, uh, and far more practical. Uh, in fact, today we have laboratories, uh, including some work here at our headquarters and uh, a particular group in India that focus on it, that's really thinking about the poorest two billion and how can computing and technology make a difference for them. And often the answers are fairly surprising. The direct application uh, isn't as important as thinking through what it means for their health activities or agricultural activities or, or learning activities. And, and uh, uh, we need a lot of new ideas there to push these things forward. The impact of software has gotten broader and broader, but many of our common activities are not yet software driven. TV uh, is still a broadcast medium. There's not much software intermediation. There's not software that's picking what segment of the news show might be interesting to you or letting you indicate, you know, give me more about that story or skip over this sport that I don't particularly care about. Uh, the ads are not being targeted to things that might be of interest and value to you, which is a win-win in terms of your interest and uh, value to the advertiser. The game show doesn't let you interact. The educational show doesn't let you pause and uh, get information about something that uh, was covered too quickly. The sports show doesn't let you get more information. So we're on the verge in the same way that uh, listening to music or or organizing photos has changed for a lot of people. The way TV is delivered is in the process of changing, but just at the beginning. 
Uh, there's a million households in the United States today, uh, primarily customers of AT&T, who are getting TV over the internet. And as you get that scale, which has to get to critical mass, then the content creators are saying to themselves, okay, let's do the extra work to take that show experience and make it far better and take it genre by genre uh, and come up with new ways that the personalization and interactivity can work. Today, the world of video is bifurcated. The uh, tail videos, the ones that aren't very popular, say videos about your uh, uh, a young kid's sports activities, you're not going to find those in the broadcast media. And so you go to your PC screen, navigate on the internet to find those, and then that's not part of the TV guide, that's part of that living room template experience. But we will have a complete synthesis of those things where uh, what you're interested in will show up on all your devices, whether it's your cell phone, that your PC screen, or in the living room, and so uh, the, the tail video, the course that you wanted to watch and see the lectures that you happened to miss, uh, those things will show up right there along with those, those mainstream things. Uh, today we don't have robotics. It's kind of an, uh, a speculative field. And part of what's missing there is a uh, software revolution so that the software, so that the robot can gather information about its environment, whether it's visual or audio. Uh, that planning type module, standards so all these different sensors can connect up and we can experiment with robotics uh, hardware without having to change the software base every time. And so that's an area where Microsoft and lots of startups, universities are investing. And I think that people are really underestimating over the course of a period like a decade how much things can change. With technology, we've always got that uh, people tend to overestimate what can change in a year or two and they underestimate the cumulative effect of change that can take place in a 10 or 15 year period. We're also subject to cycles of over-optimism and pessimism. Certainly the late 90s were kind of an insane period where every startup was going to replace your bank and your retail store and uh, people forgot that there are some benefits to experiences working those other ways and the, economic proposition that's brought there. And, and in any medium where the barrier to entry is very low, the ability to build up an asset is all the more difficult. And so only a few of those companies managed to get to the critical mass and do something interesting. Now, it was a fantastic thing. There was some crazy investment. It was like the gold rush. You know, some people did lose money, but that's what capitalism is good at, it, picking lots of wild ideas and uh, continuing to back the ones that, that work. And so. Uh, it was a period of, of, in the final analysis, quite a bit of innovation. You know, then when that bubble burst, some people went to the other extreme, thinking that uh, these changes were not really valid, that it had all been overhyped. But it was only overhyped in the sense of the time frame. Uh, you know, some of the things were not thought through. Some of the technical foundations were not there yet. You know, you take something that I've been a big believer in and, and gotten Microsoft to invest in, and I still totally believe in, things like the tablet computer, uh, where you can take notes and do your reading off of the screen. That takes an, a certain level of hardware and software, uh, usability, price, size, battery life, and what that magic threshold is that makes that a mainstream thing, where business people going to meetings take it with them, students going to classes say, of course, I take notes this way, share things this way. We're not quite there yet. We're there in certain verticals, the medical market with doctors, uh, insurance market with claim writers. And so that's getting us down that learning curve, making the software and hardware better all the time. Now, when that comes to fruition, when it really is at critical mass, it starts to have a big effect on reading, where you'll be reading things more online. Uh, we're seeing you know, Amazon with the Kindle, Sony with the ebook. Uh, uh, Microsoft with software that runs on the portable machine, doing early stages of that. And even though in the next two years you can't say it'll change, but certainly in this five to ten year period, that will be very, very different. And we can think about students uh, working that way. My daughter goes to a school that all the kids use tablet computers, and it's fascinating to see how the curriculum has changed, that when you really think not just about uh, putting the normal curriculum there, but when you think about it taking advantage of that tool, uh, how uh, fantastic it is. Uh, it also facilitates sharing information. You know, 
uh, the teacher can mail out the test results to the parents, and so you go home at night, and you, you, if you, whether your daughter wants you to know or not, you know exactly how she did on those fractions, uh, and uh, so you volunteer to help, uh, no matter no matter what. <laughs> so there are some big big changes uh, that are about to come about. I think one of the most important ones, and this is a, an area of a lot of great work going on at Microsoft and the University of Washington is the way we interface with these devices. If you look at this last 30 years or so, there have been very few changes. We've gone from a keyboard uh, to a keyboard and a mouse, fundamentally. 90% of the interaction with the machine is driven that way. And that's not going to go away for creating a document, sitting in a solo basis, and reading things, navigating things. There's a certain uh, utility and efficiency of that that uh, will we'll probably always be justified. But for the first time, we're starting to see whether it's the Nintendo Wii with the 3D controller, or the iPhone with its touch capability, or the Microsoft Surface, where it, it sees what's going on, objects, and any sort of interaction that you want to uh, have take place, or vision-type capabilities in a, in a broader sense, that uh, this idea of the computer knowing what's going on, knowing more than just how you move the mouse or hit the keyboard, uh, that that really is bringing computing into new experiences. It was just a few weeks ago that we rolled out Surface into retail stores. They were actually AT&T phone stores where people could come in, put their current phone down, uh, put a phone they were considering buying, and see a comparison. You know, what things were different, what things were better. They could look at the different plans and try those things out. They could uh, look on the phone and see the uh, different places they go to, it would show them the different coverage capabilities that they had for those things. And so you're starting to see what that'll be like. We actually think it's time to amend our slogan of a computer on every desk, uh, because with this kind of technology, we want to put a computer in every desk. We want the desktop or tabletop, we want the whiteboard to be something that's completely intelligent. As the price of the hardware comes down, even something like a mirror will change to be essentially a screen with a camera. And sure, some of the time you want to see what you really look like, uh, but some of the time you'd like to see what you'd look like wearing something different or have it maybe point out uh, you know, something that you missed or uh, uh, sh show you, a, you know, extra information. And so you can create a, a very pervasive sense of computing. Part of this will be having screens anywhere. Even the mobile phone itself will have this ability to project onto a large surface area. So if you want to read lots of information, yes, the mobile phone can connect through Bluetooth or some other means to a, another computing device, but it can also simply have projection capability. These laser displays and some of these different ways the screen hard works is not just going to bring us higher resolution, it's going to bring us uh, screens that are on all the walls, the ceilings, different places. And so, you know, when a kid thinks about their bedroom, it'll be customized the way they want it uh, until the parent walks in, where immediately it'll be customized a different way um, so that ev everybody uh, stays happy. <laughs> now, part of the thing that drives uh, computer science forward is, is uh, doing risky things, having a long-term time horizon. And when Microsoft was a small company, we benefited from the fact that AT&T and Xerox and other companies had made investments in research, that they'd reached out and worked with universities on a broad basis. So we felt very lucky that as we got to a certain level of success, we could start our own research group and have that research group be uh, in partnership with top universities all over the world doing advanced program, programs, things that range from the work on speech recognition, all the way up to quantum computing. Uh, we have a fairly serious program that has a you know, high risk of failure, uh, which makes it fun and interesting, uh, on quantum computing. And you know, even in the best case, it's probably a, a decade away before that uh, makes a difference. But that's the kind of thing that, when it works, can have incredibly high payoff. It's surprising to me how low the levels of uh, real research investment uh, by businesses are. We're certainly always trying to get the message out that more businesses should do these things. It's unfortunate that you know, AT&T did it uh, almost because of their regulated nature, and a lot of it wasn't directly uh, related to the business, so they're not, in a certain sense, a role model. It's kind of a unique thing that happened, and those unique circumstances are gone. 
Likewise, Xerox, uh, anyone who's been in the computer industry for a while, you know, thinks of that as an interesting example where they, uh, for that period of time, had a greater concentration of IQ in one place than anyone did and, and came up with uh, Ethernet, laser printing, graphics, user interface, the early stages of these things that were later refined. But the, the basic ideas came together there, and yet Xerox managed to not get any benefit out of it. In fact, they lost a lot of money. You know, there's a lot of people who've tried to analyze that. There's a book called Fumbling the Future, and uh, Microsoft, uh, soon after Park, uh, the research center that did that work, uh, kind of fell apart. We had more Xerox Park people working for us than Xerox did, and so we owe them a particular uh, debt of gratitude, not only in terms of their work, but amazing people, you know, from uh, Butler Lamps and Chuck Thacker, anyway, just an incredible group who not only do amazing work, but also have, have nurtured the next generation of brilliant people coming in and uh, taking on uh, very ambitious uh, challenges. I mentioned that there's a lot of good collaboration uh, between Microsoft and UW. The Center for Collaboration Technologies is a, a place we're very excited about the work, and we've been uh, backing that in a number of ways. Uh, analyzing photos, what we call Photosynth. Uh, the University of Washington did some key work on that, and I think people will be amazed that you, you will be able to take l just simple 2D photos from, say, a cell phone or a camera, and software will be able to figure out where that is and connect it up with other photos. And so you'll be able to synthetically essentially get uh, a sense of all the things going on in the world in different places and you can even create full 3D models out of these fairly low resolution 2D photos. And I remember five years ago, people thought that was absolutely impossible, and yet there's been breakthroughs in terms of these algorithms involved to not only make it possible, uh, but to make it practical. The, the breakthroughs in efficiency along with brute force computing uh, is combining in a, a pretty magic way. We're getting immense amounts of data. One of the projects I think is uh, very uh, cool that uh, Professor Lazowska and, and uh, someone in this lab, Keith Grashow, are, are working on is this Trident, which is a lot of marine biology undersea information. And, and we really don't know what we're going to learn from that. But it is state of the art in terms of what sort of visualization, data collection, pattern analysis that needs to get done. And, you know, so it's fun for software people to have things like that where it's interesting practical data and yet we have to make uh, advances in our interaction techniques and, and how uh, we look at, at data in a rich way. I have one good example of that uh, that I want to show you and this is kind of a new thing. Uh, I've, I've never demoed it before so uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, uh, let's see. So this, uh, we've got it. This is the... Um, Worldwide Telescope, and this is uh, Curtis Wong at Microsoft Research, along with uh, some people working with him, came up with this idea of taking astronomy data and making it widely available. It actually started with uh, Jim Gray, who was in our research lab, who thought that all those databases were not pulled together. And he worked with some astronomers who needed data from different databases to try out different ideas to test their model of the universe. And so the idea of having a schema and a taxonomy and taking things done at different times, different wavelengths, and pulling that together was done for the scientists to advance their work. And what's uh, been done uh, here is to actually take that data and say, okay, how do we take that uh, and connect it up in a way that can make astronomy interesting uh, for anybody who wants to learn about it, to make it uh, absolutely approachable in a very rich way. So you start out, you've got a... Uh, vision of the, s the sky here, uh, and you know this is a pretty neat application. That's you know the sky. Uh, first, let's go to something that's familiar uh, for you. Just go in, and we'll we'll find Jupiter out in the sky. So there's Jupiter. Uh, we can uh, zoom in, zoom out of that. You actually see these dots here. Those are the moons of Jupiter. Uh, that you know when this image was taken, that's exactly where they were, and it's, what it's doing is it's showing Jupiter as it is uh, in the sky right now. So we can go anywhere in the sky that we want. Let's pick uh, Cygnus, which uh, will let us illustrate some very interesting things. So this is data that's been collected from many, many, many different telescopes. Uh, the Hubble, the Sky Survey, uh, literally hundreds of, of different 
uh, things have been used to pull this uh, together. So here we are uh, at uh, Cygnus. Uh, so I can go in and uh, uh, look at that. Okay, so this, uh, so let, let's look at this in different ways. Uh, okay, that, that's, so to start out with, we're in the visible uh, wavelength. Now we're seeing hydrogen alpha, we can see dust map. Uh, one that's particularly interesting is to look at this in the X-ray, because if you look in X-rays, you can see where there were supernovas. There's always an echo left over after that supernova. So we see this big uh, thing down here. Uh, we can go in and zoom in on that a little bit and say, okay, that's interesting. Well, what does that look like if we just look at in the, uh, the visual wavelength, we can see, okay, there's what the dust cloud looks like uh, from a supernova that this is actually 5,000 years ago. Uh, but if I go back here, I can see, okay, it shows up in the X-ray, but not quite the same way in that different wavelength. And so we can try out different things to see what patterns different type of uh, phenomena are going to uh, create there. Uh, let's go do something else. Let's see. Uh, well, let's go over to uh, Crab Nebula. And you can see it actually navigates the sky, kind of gives you a sense of where you're going. You can go straight there if you want, but I always think it's interesting to see what the relative positions of these things are. So that's the Crab Nebula in uh, the uh, uh, visual range. And so get, here again, you know, there's, it is in the X-ray, there's in the IR. Uh, and these things are registered on top of each other. You see we're not moving at all because these databases have been correlated in a way that it's all in that same location. Now, so, so far what I've shown you is, you know, how I'm uh, guiding things around myself. Another thing you can do uh, is go out and, and look into databases about this information. Uh, so I can just right click uh, something and it'll, it'll show me uh, all the different things on the web that might be uh, interesting about, about that information, anything that I want to point to here. We also have what are called guided tours, where instead of going around yourself, somebody can record uh, the, the things that they've done, and they can have voiceovers. We make it very easy for them to build those things. Uh, this is one that Alyssa Goodman did. Uh, she's at The Milky Way at, is at a Harvard. spiral galaxy, but it's hard to see that because we're inside it. Here's a spiral galaxy not far from us, about 12 million light years away, called M81. If we look at it in optical light, we see billions of stars shining together in a spiral pattern. If we look at the heat from M81 rather than the light, it looks like the false color orangey image we see here. This Spitzer Space Telescope image... You I can pause at any time and look at the images in different ways and go back into the tour. Or again, I can go, you know, right click and uh, see this is a spiral galaxy and again go out and get any data that's out there on the web. To give you a sense of how easy it is uh, to make these guided tours, uh, let's go into one, see one that was created literally by a six-year-old uh, about the Ring Nebula where, you know, he's able to share his fascination to using this worldwide telescope uh, and share that with other students. Hi, my name is Benjamin. I am six years old and I live here. <laughs> Actually, I live over here in a big city called Toronto. On clear nights when I look up in the sky, I see something like... This. The tour I want to take you on is of the Ring Nebula, which Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, also calls M57. I don't know what that we'll means. This. The Ring ahead. Nebula was discovered a long time ago by someone in France. This picture of the nebula is beautiful. It looks like a precious blue gem in the middle of some red orangey stuff that looks like fire. Anyway, it gives you a quick glance of the, this worldwide telescope that I think illustrates a lot of things. We've got a lot of data out there, and with the right software, we can make it approachable and understandable. And in fact, uh, uh, in the next month or so, this will go up for free at uh, www.worldwide 
uh, telescope and just be you know, a piece of software that any teacher or student can use. And we'll be collecting the really good tours that people create and have those uh, just show up in the catalog so that over time people get uh, better at making that a, a subject that's fun and approachable uh, using the magic of software and the, the rich data that's available. Now, making sure that this innovation is going ahead at full speed, and we want to enable people of all ages. We want uh, students uh, to have access. We want them to have the latest and greatest tools. Uh, you know, many of the breakthroughs have been made by uh, people are, that are, are very young. Uh, Microsoft has a lot of things. One is called DreamSpark, uh, which is where we made all our development tools free to students now, uh, where they can try things out. And we've also created a lot of online, essentially, uh, TV channels, but of course very interactive, uh, one we call Channel 8, uh, that has all the information, programming courses, advice, uh, sample code, and really putting a big investment in that to make sure that anyone who can get to the internet can uh, polish up their skills, see what good code looks like, uh, and uh, really pursue their ideas, whether it's about software itself, or rather they have an idea about another field, one of the sciences or uh, any idea, and actually are using software merely as a tool uh, to uh, understand those things and uh, uh, encode the, the algorithm that they have. Now, when we look at this very optimistic view, which I think is a, a totally valid view, one lens that it is important that we continue to apply to it is to say, okay, with all these advances, the breakthroughs in software and the tools that are, you know, make TV more fun and mobile phones more fun, so you're talking to them and you can share with your friends where you are. Uh, how do we take these breakthroughs um, of all the sciences, uh, particularly including medicine, and make them available to everyone. I mean, after all, there's sort of a natural thing that uh, can prevent that from happening if we're not careful, which is the interests and needs of the richest have the most powerful voice in the marketplace. And so you'll see disparities that take place where medical conditions like malaria or an AIDS vaccine receive substantially less focus than something like baldness or erectile dysfunction. Uh, in fact, you have a pretty significant ratio in those things. And it's not that the companies involved are doing something wrong. It's that there isn't a mechanism uh, that outside sends that message that those things are worth working on. Uh, the same thing is true specifically in computing. You know, what, what, how should we get computers out uh, to people on a very broad basis? There was a joint project between uh, the foundation and, and Microsoft to get computers into libraries. That was done in the United States about... 60,000 computers were put into 18,000 libraries, and it was a huge success. Uh, it was particularly transformative in rural areas where people didn't have broadband access and uh, they weren't as likely to be able to afford the computer on their own. And it, you know, at first the librarians were a little worried. Would kids still come and get books? Would the machines work well? And th there was a lot of learning that took place, but in the end it was phenomenally successful. In fact, the number of books being checked out uh, went up as more traffic was coming to the library, and kids didn't just play games, they uh, did things that were interesting and valuable. And a lot of adults came in uh, to learn new skills, to stay in touch with relatives, uh, to understand about health conditions, and it's been phenomenal to track that. That's now been taken to a number of countries, Mexico, Chile, uh, Botswana, Lithuania. Uh, there's uh, another six countries that were in the process of uh, doing the pilots and doing the rollouts to take this idea that in the same sense that libraries uh, were deemed to be something everybody should get to because literacy was, uh, should be available to all, now this access to uh, computing and software and the internet and the things it makes available, we should make that uh, push on for that same type of accessibility. In fact, if we look across many areas of activity, banking, the ability to have a savings account, you know, the poor, need that in particular, the ability to get loans. And it is interesting to think how we could draw in some of the large successful companies into helping out with these things. It's an area that I've uh, used the phrase creative capitalism to describe that. And in fact, if you just took the best practices of the leading companies and had the average company doing as well, I think that this gap between how quickly and how well we map technologies into the needs of the, of the, 
of the most needy, of the poorest, would change uh, very, very dramatically. And so that's uh, certainly a topic that uh, I'll be putting a, a lot of time into, in, sitting down with companies, talking to them, uh, creating awards, creating positive feedback for the ones that do it. Uh, maybe somebody will figure out how to get negative feedback to the ones who don't do it, uh, and creating, hopefully, uh, some real momentum uh, behind that. So, you know, I'm very optimistic about uh, software. I can't imagine why software is not the, the most overcrowded field in the world, you know. Uh, what, what could be more interesting than working on these tough problems and being able to have this kind of impact to build uh, magic new devices? And in fact, you know, what I and my generation got to do these last 30 years really pales in comparison uh, to what you'll be able to do uh, in the next year, 30 years ahead. Thank you. And, uh, and now Bill's, uh, Bill's going to take some questions for a little while. Uh, before we get to there, Bill, when you were backstage, I was introducing your family and realized I don't think I introduced uh, your, your sister. You want to introduce your, your, your Well, both family? my sisters are here. I know. Uh, ask but I, I forgot Libby. Stand up. Libby Armitage. Uh, did, did I introduce you, Libby? I forgot. <laughs> no, Libby Armitage. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, Libby Armitage is here as well. So, um, Let's, let's set some rules, some ground rules. First of all, um, there's microphones here. Are there, are there any place else? Are they just one, two? Oh, those, I'm sorry, there's one up there. And it's a little hard to see you up there, so if you queue up on that microphone, you might wave a little bit. Uh, we'd like questions to be short, preferably really questions, not speeches. And we have a strong bias day for students, but we'll let you begin. Oh, you're manning the mic, OK. <laughs> All right, good. So, please. Okay, it's not a speech, but just a really quick comment. Um, I hope in addition to businesses, you'll have the opportunity to reach out to the business schools. Um, I'm a second year MBA student, and um, we really need support um, getting the professors and the people on our boards um, to really support creative capitalism and that kind of curriculum. Um, my sister works at PATH, which is a local nonprofit um, that really tries to use partnerships um, to solve some of the world's health problems. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about public-private partnerships um, and your intelligence with, with them. Thanks. Yeah, well, First, in terms of the business school, I agree. We, we need to get business thinkers putting their creativity to these things, particularly because, you know, to some degree, when you have a market failure, how you create market incentives and, and do things are important. And there's some novel ideas like advanced market commitment that can take normal business type incentives and bring them into these areas that that hasn't existed. In terms of PATH and partnerships, PATH uh, is an incredible group. And uh, the foundation does an, an, a large number of programs with them because they've uh, these tough challenges of really getting things done in developing countries and getting to know the governments and help the governments. I think they're uh, probably the best at doing that. So a lot of our vaccination rollouts and uh, programs where we're figuring things out are, are done through PATH. The, the fact is that the governments in the developing countries, you want to partner with them. If you're going to build a great vaccination system, if you're going to have good infrastructure in terms of roads and electricity and education, you really can't do that without the government being involved. There are extreme cases where you have to try to uh, because they're, they're not there to do it. But in all the cases where you're really going to get the virtuous cycle going, you've got to work with that government. Now, you can imagine that for that government, it's tough where they have lots of non-governmental organizations coming in and asking them to do various things and how those things get measured. They've got the various UN groups. And these governments uh, haven't been able to attract in uh, necessarily the same type of talent or even uh, infrastructure to, to manage things. So really helping those governments do better, uh, training programs, uh, uh, funding their infrastructure, and getting it so, say, the Department of Health, which is sort of the lowest on the pecking order, uh, gets treated in a, a different way. And that's very important. And so it, the, 
giving them some of that expertise from outside, which is the public-private partnership, that's been the key vehicle, and it's been great to see how that's grown up and it's uh, being used far more broadly to get those governments where you want to go. So in short, you'd agree that political science is the mother of all disciplines, is that? <laughs> <laughs> in terms of organi organizing <laughs> humans, yes. Okay. Uh, over here. Thanks. I know that you and the foundation have done a lot with urban schools in the U.S., and my understanding is that there's been more of a focus on high schools than elementary schools. So I was wondering the reason for that focus and what you think it'll take to make urban schools successful, and then more generally, which of your charitable activities you think have had the most success and which have had the least positive impact and why? Well, in education, the foundation is primarily focused on high schools uh, for a couple reasons. One is that we saw that as an area where not as many other people were focused. And if you look at where the United States goes from being uh, pretty near the top to pretty near the bottom, that's happening in uh, ninth through 12th grade. At eighth grade, we're actually pretty decent. Uh, by senior year, we're, we're not decent at all. And that's also where you get a high degree of dropouts. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that some of that uh, can't be fixed and improved by a focus on elementary school, but we've just chosen in terms of new school designs where you can go in, do charter schools, and we've done over a thousand that have different designs. They're uh, almost all smaller schools. Uh, they're almost all thematic. Uh, some are science focused, some are uh, by outward bound or more outdoors focused. There's some that are construction focus, they use that as the paradigm to teach the different uh, subjects. It's kind of amazing how well that works, where you're taking less subjects, but you're doing things on a very project-oriented basis. And so we, we're starting to see some pretty good results there. Now, it's always easy to create a few schools. It's when you really get up to scale and you're bringing in the, the truly uh, average student, the truly average teacher, it's a system that can change that that really can make a difference in terms of the inequity we've got where uh, if you go to a bad high school, even if you're smart, the likelihood is you won't find it engaging, you'll drop out, and then your life uh, outcome is really kind of unfair. It's not, not fitting in with uh, the idea of equal opportunity that we believe in. So we've, we've been focused just on that, uh, and uh, you know we, that's going to take us a long time and a lot of partners to try and prove out uh, some improved approaches there. In terms of what's worked and what hasn't worked, we're, it's probably too early to say that. The thing that I, I can't say has worked is vaccination, where we've given uh, now well over a billion dollars to a group called Global Alliance for Vaccines, where they take the vaccines that we have today and get broader coverage, uh, and they help make sure new vaccines that get introduced in rich countries that the typical 25-year time frame between being used in a rich country before they're uh, in developing countries where most of the need is, uh, to shorten that down to a few years, and in some cases get vaccines that uh, are relevant to the poor countries because they have infectious diseases that we don't, uh, like malaria, get them out there in a, a novel basis. And that, that's gotten off to a very quick start. In fact, uh, millions of lives have been saved. And as you save lives, you have this effect on the society that, ironically, the population growth goes down because parents are trying to have two children survive to support them in adulthood. So when you have a high death rate, you actually get a high population growth rate mm -hmm. because of the insurance effect that some overachieve all their kids live. Uh, and so the difficulty of that society to educate and, and feed and create jobs is just overwhelmed. It's, it's purely Malthusian that you hit, you hit the limits where everybody's just at the bare level of, of survival. As you bring health in, that starts the virtuous cycle that really gets things going. So I'd say health is where we've had the biggest impact. Now, we haven't uh, solved malaria or AIDS or some of the, the big killers, and you know this thing's going to take uh, decades of focus before we have uh, even I, as an optimist, would say that we've uh, been able to tackle most all of, of those diseases. In terms of what hasn't worked, it, you know, there's certainly some things in the education realm where we tried to push too much change too quickly. And 
uh, didn't get all the constituencies involved and enthused in that. And so there's a certain delicacy there that uh, is going to make that a, a tough one. But in terms of causes that count for this country, you know, it's, it's overwhelmingly the one uh, I think of greatest importance. So even as we have to learn things and try it in new ways, we'll, we'll stay focused on it. Let's, uh, let's go up here. I think there's someone up there. Yes, thank yes. you. Uh, Mr. Gates, I wanted to know, what made you so passionate about Microsoft during the early days that you were willing to drop out of college and uh, pursue it wholeheartedly? Like, what caused you to really, really believe in this idea and that it was worth pursuing? But you're not going to take this as a recommendation to drop out of college, right? <laughs> no, I'm about to graduate soon, so okay, it's okay. Okay, good. All right. All right. You can answer that one then. It's okay. Well, if you have an idea like Microsoft, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, key, the key thing was that Paul, Alan, and I had loved working on software since we were lucky enough to be exposed. Literally, I was uh, 13 in eighth grade when this time-sharing terminal came in, and we just did it day and night and you know, got better, and we could see that the magic of software combined with this miracle of the microprocessor subject to Moore's law, exponential improvement, that that was a magic combination. And we'd, we'd look around and say, hey, how come everybody's not saying this is amazing? I mean, we're going to dethrone IBM. And uh, you know, why doesn't digital equipment get it? Why is the guy who runs it? This is a company that's long gone, uh, but dominated many computers at the time. Why isn't that guy up there saying it's, it's wrong? We know it's right. And so the key event for us was, it was a very cold Boston winter, and a kit computer came out on uh, this popular electronics magazine, and we said, oh, damn, this is happening without us. I mean, here we are uh, doing nothing. And so we called the company up and said, you know, hey, we're ready. Uh, and then we called them back. We actually did the work, and then we called them back and said, how do you make the stuff go in and out of the computer, the I.O.? And they said, well, that's interesting. Nobody else has ever asked that. You must really be doing something. So that was, anyway, our very first customer. And so we grabbed on to it to be the very first. And we were the first to say there should be a software industry and, and come and do it. In a sense, it was one of the lower risk things I've ever done in my life because you know, I could have always gone back. Uh, you know, well, my parents, my dad didn't say, hey, if you go away for a few years, I'll stop paying for your education. They were nice and said, OK, go. You know, learn your lesson down there in the desert, and uh, <laughs> and you get back to the serious stuff. And you know, we're still we're still waiting. <laughs> so, did Christy Libby, did you think he'd lost his mind? Did you, mm -hmm. you were wondering what you, how your brother had fallen from grace, probably. Yeah. Well, it worked out okay. <laughs> yes. So, um, Mr. Gates, one thing I'm just curious to hear your opinion on. Um, I love the, just this vision you have about having a computer on practically every surface, but I'm just wondering if perhaps that's actually setting us up for a big environmental disaster, just with how damaging it is to create and dispose these things. So I'm just wondering, um, do you see, think that these issues would provide a barrier, or do you think that they basically have been or are about to be solved? Well, there's some, there are important issues to be solved. The, the devices are becoming smaller and smaller. So in, in a certain sense, the amount of material required to build them and the types of the material, I don't think there's a major problem there. I mean, if you go from having a CRT, which has all that glass and funny stuff in it, to a laser projection thing that's using, say, a plastic light guide, that is way less material. So the main issue is not from a pure material point of view. There is a, a energy consumption involved in these things. They are more efficient than they were. CRTs waste a lot of energy heating that stream up. The key thing we need is, is energy sources that don't cause environmental side effects and that are dramatically cheaper. You can't just say to the poor, hey, use less energy, because energy for them, clean water, uh, is energy, fertilizer is energy, getting to their job is energy, the cost of food is energy. You really need to take this slope where the price of energy has come down and down and down and down and the consumption has gone up and up and find a way to do that that has no negative side effect. And fortunately, there are uh, every minute the sun delivers to the planet 10,000 times as much energy as we need. So we just need to tap into that in one of a, a variety of ways. So 
you're right, unless we find friendly en energy sources, there could be a problem. But uh, fortunately, I think there are some great uh, paths that will lead to the, the breakthrough that will eliminate that as a constraint. Over here. Hi. Um, so my question is about health care. In the U.S., we spend a lot of money on health care, but we have kind of a large disparity in what the kind of health care that the rich get in this country and what the poor get. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that and how we can go about fixing that. Yeah, the U.S. has a pretty severe inequity in its health care system, as well as dramatically the most expensive health care system. They, it's one of these complex systems where the incentives to the various pieces are not adding up to the appropriate outcome. So things like you know, preventing somebody from having an asthma attack and spending the money and being very good at that and measuring the right way to do that, having that be the reward of behavior rather than I mean, this will sound perverse, but making more money by having the person show up for an expensive mm -hmm. episode, and you know that that creates a uh, a source of income. So the health is a health and education. But let's just take health uh, are are very difficult environments to design the right type of incentive systems for. Some things like you know restaurants, which one should be there, or what consumer electronics there should be, or what kind of software there should be. The normal, just straightforward application of capitalistic markets works very well. In these other areas, we really have a problem in terms of what standards, what quality measures, what data uh, needs to be available. Now, there's some very good ideas uh, that are out there. The guy who runs uh, Kaiser uh, wrote a book that uh, you know, healthcare reform now that talks about it, a different approach that would change these things. So there's a recognition that if you just extrapolate, we've got a problem. Data processing is an element of it, but it, it's more of an enabler to get the incentive system right. It's not like if we magically had all the data online that it would, it would cure these things, but it would let you get to measurements at the points that, that are really the right points of intervention. Yes. You had mentioned television as something that's not taking sort of full advantage of software. I was wondering what you think the role of gaming platforms such as like Xbox 360 would be in changing that as well as bringing new technology sort of into the living room. Yeah, that's a very good point. The, there is a video experience that's interactive today, which is video gaming. And so in some ways, parts of TV in the future look more like Xbox Live than they look like just changing channels and watching a few things. In Xbox Live today, you can see what your friends are doing. You can talk to your friends while you do it. You can organize things. There's contests. And so it's very, very interactive. And in fact, the logic, the chips that are in that Xbox 360, they will be the set-top box. And so just because silicon gets cheap, the ability to have that kind of video display power, every set-top box of this uh, media room, internet TV approach will be able to let you interact and play games like that. So uh, it'll be the same system that's letting you play Halo 4, 5, 6, uh, as well as watch the news in a way that's personalized so different things are showing up, just one box. And so there's this unification of what was set-top box video game PC that are three different things today. And Microsoft chosen to be involved in all three because the skill sets of how you build the software platform and get the software developer relationships are different enough in those three that we thought as that comes together, we'd be better off if we make the investment to understand each of them when they're uh, separated markets. And when you can do your homework on it, then it'll be perfected. <laughs> uh, yes, up above. Uh, you mentioned earlier that um, data processing is one of uh, several aspects of the um, that, that we may require reform in, in the health system, which sort of leads into my question, which is um, the um, Gates Foundation has made its, so one of its primary focuses being um, the uh, being the the promotion of, of public health in the um, in the third world countries. I was wondering what your take was on how um, Microsoft or um, this, the um, computer industry in general can contribute to um, to uh, to public health and, and to healthcare more generally? Well, the, you know, the biggest contribution that 
Microsoft makes to healthcare is kind of an indirect one that the value of, of Microsoft stock uh, goes to the foundation and then the foundation sends it to healthcare. Uh, <laughs> but there are all, also things that are very direct in terms of software uh, innovation. Uh, and this week I've actually been in a couple forums talking about the boundary between software and biology. I was at the Department of Genomics, uh, actually in this room two days ago, uh, talking about that. And then on Monday I was over at the uh, Institute of Systems Biology uh, talking about that. And there's a huge number of projects at Microsoft that have to do with mach applying machine learning to healthcare topics. In fact, one of the most interesting is taking machine learning and looking at what's going on with the AIDS vaccine. You know, some of you probably saw that Merck, uh, the drug company, had a trial of an AIDS vaccine that failed, which was a real setback. But in fact, by taking the blood and looking at the data from that, uh, the, a Microsoft researcher, David Heckerman, and uh, some colleagues in the medical industry are seeing that, that certain people did respond well and be able to see, okay, what it was that caused them to respond well. And so, it, it, although it's a failure, if we analyze it the right way, apply the right software, it should help us point to where we can eventually get a successful trial, and it, it looks fairly promising. So by looking at that boundary of software and biology, whether it's symbolic representations or data visualizations, Microsoft Research is uh, trying to get involved, bridge the gap there. You know, there are other things a company can do as an employer, but the biggest impact a company can have is staying within its area of expertise. Uh, so, you know, to make sure that the education systems around the world, that they get good software, and we have do a donation program where we've done, called, it's called Partners in Learning, we have deals with 132 countries, how we grant them software and fund teacher training in each of those countries. So. Microsoft's main thing will be about that library access, that school access, the free software, the training, you know, the job skills and the partners that are in that uh, country, uh, not, not, not so much healthcare. And whereas the big drug companies, we need to get them into the healthcare issues, and the banks, we need to get into microfinance, and the food companies, we need to get into micronutrients and buying the output of the farmers in these poor countries so that the their economies get going. So I think everybody's got a big role to play, but it's, it's going to be fairly centered on the thing that, that the employees know and uh, drives their, their specific contribution. Let's go over to one again. Hey, Bill. I'd like to know, um, when you're a young entrepreneur, you've probably had a lot of ideas, and I'd like to know how you decided um, to focus on one, and if there's any runner-ups that you'd like to share with us. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, Paul and Al and I were fascinated by many things. We, you know, we thought, hey, maybe we'll go work on fusion, which I'm glad we didn't, because uh, <laughs> uh, it's still 50 years away. Uh, uh, we, we felt a little bad, I, I, certainly I did, about leaving the university when uh, I thought very interesting work on artificial intelligence was really on the verge of taking place and symbolically proving programs were correct. Ironically, now, you know, it's taken a long time. The rate of progress, which is hard to make numeric, in both those areas has been quite modest. I mean, we haven't gone backwards or anything, but AI has turned out to be a tougher problem, which is, is fascinating. And now there, there are some interesting advances, and likewise symbolic type things. There are some now advances. So we thought we'd miss uh, being more at the center of those. Now through at least funding Microsoft Research, we get to, to have some a level of involvement in that. One of Paul's ideas was to build a 360 emulator. That was the dominant mainframe of the time, use bit slice uh, architecture to just you know, blow away the pricing on mainframe computing. But we decided that was kind of boring uh, compared to personal computing. A company came along about five years later, 2Pi, and did it. Uh, they didn't do the software piece right. That's why they failed, because uh, we still think it was a good idea. But we didn't have anything even close to, hey, let's build the computer that we want to use, that we want to have as a tool for our own uh, messing around and communication and, and creativity. That, that kind of got at the center of our thinking, even from the, the early days. Let's go back over here. Good afternoon, Mr. Gates. 
So uh, earlier in your talk, you mentioned that you would be changing, or Microsoft, one of Microsoft's goals would be changing the way we, we do search. And certainly when you think of search, at least in competition with Microsoft, the name that comes up is Google. And I've uh, attended a few talks by Steve Ballmer, and he mentioned a phrase multiple times in different talks that the only market that Google has succeeded in is search. And while that certainly used to be true, it's not necessarily going to be true very soon, or it might not already be true right now. They're sort of expanding in a lot of different areas. And I was curious how Microsoft's attack strategy on not only Google, but just that search problem in general that you hinted at earlier, uh, what that was going to be like in the future. But what, what, what's another place that you think they'll be making money in soon? Well, they're, they're really big into advertising. Well, search is advertising. Right, yeah, yeah. okay, yeah. <laughs> but they, you know, they have uh, the Google Earth, which is quite popular. They have Gmail, which is quite popular. No, it's, anybody can give things away. Uh, honestly, uh, it's not that hard to do. Uh, uh, so, uh, anyway, the qualification was things they make money. But it, they're a great company. They're doing lots of good work, and who knows what other things. But fundamentally, that search advertising nexus uh, is a, more than 100% of their uh, current profit stream, and a very nice profit stream indeed. Uh, in the area of search, you know, today it's about getting those 10 links and you click on them and you, know, you go somewhere. It's hardly likely that no matter who leads the field, that in five years or 10 years, that search will look anything like that. That is your intent as you type in that text phrase in terms of the domain that you're interested in and the structured information or the answers you want in that arena, that text combined with whatever history you have of uh, having bought cameras or visited places or different things that uh, are known digitally about you, you're gonna be able to do radically better than just bringing back those links. And so what we'd like to do is have a competition where you have uh, some number greater than one of companies you know, who are doing state-of-the-art work and getting that traffic and learning and trying out those new things. And often, if you're number two, and in this case, a distant number two, uh, you can try harder, uh, so to speak, and try out new things that are, are quite different. It's a super interesting area because when you think about, okay, I'm in Microsoft Office and I'm creating a document, I want to search or something. Well, that's a context of what you've been typing and doing there. It's not just a little phrase in a search box. If you're inside a company and you're searching for something that's interesting, it's not just the web, it's the protected information, it's the structured information of the org chart and the emails that went around. And so we think of search broadly with long sentences and direct answers and personalization. You know, we have not, we as a field just scratch the surface of what's possible there, and so we'd like to contribute to that area of software. Yes, up on top. Uh, hi. I was, I was just uh, wondering, I'm an electrical engineering and digital arts major, and in the arts uh, there's been kind of a uh, growing talk about interfacing in general and the future of it, and I know you touched on two-dimensional interfacing, but I was curious to know your thoughts on the future of uh, three-dimensional interfacing and three-dimensional visual and audio? Well, 3D audio is actually, uh, there's some pretty good stuff there in terms of outputting the audio. 3D screens, there's always progress, and the question is, is it, is it good enough? Is it becoming mainstream? Recently, there's these uh, different ways that multiple viewers can see different things, and you can project it out the different eyes. We're, Microsoft Research is playing around with those things. I think the biggest thing in terms of 3D is that as you have camera, pervasive cameras, they're able to see things and model those things. And so, you know, the video game of some years in the future, instead of having to f hold a funny controller, you will literally just take your tennis racket and swing it, or your bat and swing it, hopefully you hold on to it. Uh, and it will see exactly what's going on. It won't just be this low resolution thing that's just at one place. It'll actually be watching that. So I, I think vision in terms of 3D acquisition is the big thing. And the progress there uh, in the field and specifically some of the uh, uh, Microsoft work on that says that vision is right. We are in the sweet spot in these next four or five years where the fact those cameras are so cheap 
and the processing power is so good and the software is getting a lot smarter that it will be very typical to think of the computer being able to see. I mean, literally, you'll be able to take a cell phone uh, and, you know, hold it up and it'll see exactly what is going on in terms of the people, reminding you the person's name, uh, that they owe you money, whatever uh, it should tell you, you won't have to, to think, what is their dog's name? Um, Good. Yes? Uh, how is Microsoft applying lessons learned from the development of Windows Vista to current projects and how, what do you think the software industry as a whole can learn from some of the problems that were encountered? Well, every software project is a glass half full in terms of things that went super well and things that didn't go super well. And, you know, and the great thing about software is, particularly if your software is popular, you hear back from users. Uh, they tell you what they like, what they don't like. You know, maybe there's a device driver missing. Maybe the error message isn't perfectly clear uh, on exactly what you're supposed to do. You hear about it. And it's great because that creates that, that feedback loop. We hear about it in a variety of ways. One is the monitoring system called Watson, we call it Watson, that sees whenever a system is hanging or crashing or whatever error messages there are in that system. And we get literally daily a log of that. So we can see, is somebody releasing a piece of software that works a certain way or a driver that, that works a certain way? The si Microsoft is working in large-scale software. Uh, software that is millions of lines of code. And in a certain sense, that's one of the most complex engineering projects in the world. You know, people talk about putting a man on the moon. Well, you know, we spend more money than was spent to put the man on the moon uh, on software. And, you know, it uh, has these compatibility constraints. There are some really great things we've done in terms of how we plan, how we prototype, how we do performance things that are being used in this next round. It's codenamed Windows 7. It doesn't have a, a real name yet. So it's a big, I'm very excited about the work that's being done and the way it's being done, all those things. So there are very good lessons that, that come out of all the major projects. Let's, uh, let's stay over here. Hi, my name is Laura Metsu, and for the last 12 months, I've been acting as the project manager to open a high school in Ethiopia. And over the past 12 months, we've gotten our teachers and staff lined up. We've gotten a pending 15-acre grant from the government of Ethiopia, and my, my team has met with the prime minister's cabinet and gotten their approval. Our next step is looking for grants. As the founder of the Gates Foundation, what is your number one piece of advice for somebody who's looking, seeking for an educational grant? <laughs> well, uh, I think if you could find expatriates from Ethiopia, if there was a way to you know, get them together as a group and have them feel enthused about it, both in terms of uh, financial support and uh, getting involved and providing some of their talent, that sort of reverse brain drain asset is a, a very important thing. You know, it's a tough one in terms of there's not, you know, education is so particular in the country in terms of how teachers are hired and what those skill sets are. It, in any sort of scale sense, external aid into country educational systems hasn't been able to have that much of an impact. You know, the idea that you're personally involved and you want to make that thing great, uh, you know, hopefully you'll find colleagues or people who believe in that and see it as catalytic within that that country. We do a lot of healthcare things. You know, Ethiopia is one of the places where the hold that malaria has is tenuous enough that we should be able to make a big benefit. So most of what I know about that, that the country in particular relates to uh, getting rid of, of malaria and some of the other health things. So, you know, good luck. If I think of more ideas, I'll let you know. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, over here. Oh, hello, Mr. Gates. My name is Kathy, and I'm a business school student. My question is on the importance of early learning. I know that the foundation contributed a great amount of money to the White Center um, early learning. So my question to you is, what do you hope to accomplish with early learning? How is it different from reg present childcare? And do you hope to take and contribute money to early learning in other countries as well? 
Yeah, the early learning, we have a couple pilot groups. Uh, my dad knows a lot more about this than I do uh, in terms of what we're doing, but we have a couple of pilots here in Washington State. Correct me if I say anything wrong. Uh, and we benefited from going to a number of people uh, who were doing this before us. Uh, Susie Buffett, Warren's daughter in Omaha, uh, had done some projects that looked very promising in terms of what they were doing. And so, in large part, we've taken what's gone on in Omaha, what's gone on in Chicago, and we're applying those lessons. And there's a lot that's been learned from Head Start. The question is, can you have this lasting impact, and how much, how much resource does it take to create the environment and have that, that lasting impact? And we are just one of many, you know, we're not a major player in early learning, but you know, we think we're a participant. If these pilots go well, uh, then we'll be doing other things. Our education's have overwhelmingly in this high school area, but we decided to be, uh, to join in with others who, you know, see early learning and, and try and gather the data that could justify uh, the government putting more into that exercise. You know, beyond that, you know, I'd love to have you speak to people at the foundation about uh, how, we're, how we're going about it. Definitely. Definitely. I'll give you One, my part. We have, we have time for just... <laughs> We have time for just one last question. I'll go with this gentleman right here. All right. As chairman of uh, both the largest nonprofit as well as one of the largest uh, for-profit corporations, how do you uh, contrast the responsibility of, you know, just wealthy private individuals giving versus that of corporations? And, you know, is it different types of projects that they should be going towards or anything of that nature? Well, there's definitely a big difference between corporate giving and, and individual giving. You know, for the corporation, there are communities that it's a member of that you want your employees to volunteer in and get involved in uh, to improve the community. Microsoft's actually biggest thing in the community is, is a match program where whatever gifts our employees want to give, we match. So it just takes their intelligence about what's important and uh, doubles it up. We also are big believers in, in United Way and, and what goes on there, and that's more at a business level, we sort of think every business ought to do that as a basic thing because social services, uh, we think, have a, a per deserve particular priority in terms of drawing employees in to, to help, help the community. And there's ways to take those fundraising things within a company and have contests and comparisons and great stories, get the word out, make it fun, make it easy. You know, it's just a piece of email. The easiest thing to do is click and say you want to give your fair share, and then we send you no more email. Uh, so we've <laughs> made it the easiest thing to do is, is, uh, is participate. In terms of individuals, it's quite different. You know, you can take and give to groups like United Way who are really thinking about everything in the community, or you can find things, and most people mix this, you can find things that you're particularly interested in, that you know about, that a relative benefited from, or that you want to go and volunteer in. Uh, you know, Microsoft does a thing now for every hour that somebody volunteers, we actually uh, make a grant to that organization because that says that they're, they care about it and uh, they think it's, it's doing very good work. Now, for individuals at some levels, probably most your giving is going to be in the community where you know what's going on. I'm a big believer that, that the, some of the greatest inequities are on a global basis. And so uh, one of the things our foundation tries to get out is the names of a number of organizations like Save the Children or Global Fund or Vaccine Fund that we know are taking dollars in a very efficient way and saving lives and improving conditions. And you know, I would hope that as people are able to be fairly generous that this international component, that it be part of, of what they're doing. Obviously, if you get up to enough scale, then you can uh, take on big projects and I will get a chance with some of my extra time to go out and, and share with people who are uh, lucky enough to have wealth uh, and just tell them how much fun I'm having and that it can have impact and you know, hopefully encourage it. I, I think when Warren Buffett gave, gave his gift, it sent a message to people that, wow, uh, you know, we got, we, we, this is the, the right thing to do and you know, he, he doesn't like to waste money. Uh, so, you know, a sense that there are causes out there that you can make a big difference with. So, I, you know, I hope we're creating a wave of it. I definitely see, in, particularly in younger people, more of an interest in not just having a great job, but having the company they're involved with 
being one that has a good impact, uh, and having their giving and time and uh, focused on things that have a broad impact in the world. And they can have a bigger awareness now through the internet of these deep inequities, and so hopefully that'll will activate people. I do think the next uh, 20 years will be big in terms of uh, generosity of, of the rich and a generation that shows both in terms of buying products, things like uh, the red campaign or their political voice, that they want more of this global generosity. But you know that, that could just be my optimism, but uh, I'll, I'll see if it, I can help, help it come true as well. Well, sitting here listening to, uh, to all your answers, Bill, uh, I know most people in the audience uh, share my sentiment that it's, it's hard to imagine anybody from our community having a greater impact, not just here in Seattle or in the Pacific Northwest, but greater impact, period. And we at the University of Washington are delighted that you've ended uh, your university tour here. It's been great fun to have you, and I'd like you all to join me in thanking Bill for all that he's done and his sharing his time with us today. Thank you.